Welcome to Pitmaster, an old Virginia Smoke podcast. I'm your host, Luke Darnell. This man needs very little introduction. He's been a force to be reckoned with on the barbecue scene, both in competition and in other venues. He's all about business, as they say. I think you'll learn a lot and be highly entertained by this interview with David Qualls from the American Dream Barbecue Team. While you're enjoying this podcast, please share it out on your social media, and also be sure to like the podcast on the service of your choice. Every little bit helps. So please join me in welcoming David Qualls. The Barbecue League is the ultimate barbecue experience, and here's why. One small annual investment from you instantly unlocks all 70-plus tell-all recipes, enthusiast recipes, restaurant tours, and more in their unmatched library. This isn't your typical YouTube-type content. World champions like Getting Basted, Shake and Bake Barbecue, Heavy Smoke Barbecue, and La Pasadita and 913 share their full tell-all recipes. No secret is left unsaid. And a new video release is guaranteed every single week of your membership. You'll also see unfiltered looks from all levels of pit masters during their live competition coverage. And those same pit masters are accessible through the league's upbeat online community. As soon as you sign up, you'll also have a full arsenal of some of the best discounts on barbecue from brands like Snake River Farms, Blues Hog, Big Papa Smokers, Gunter Wilhelm, Gateway Drum Smokers, and more. The Barbecue League puts on members-only contests throughout the year, hosts live and virtual events, and offers a full access league lounge at participating events. And if you haven't looked at the American Royal results, a lot of those teams that got calls were part of the Barbecue League. So... To say that this is worth its money is, is an understatement. So our listeners can receive $10 off of the $100 annual and membership this month by using the code September Pitmaster on the barbecueleague.com. All right. I am very excited about today's guest. Today we have David Qualls, barbecue legend from Oklahoma. How are you doing, my friend? Well, <laughs> Thanks for the moniker. Uh, I'm doing good. <laughs> Thanks for having me on the show. Legend. I'm trying to think about when the first time we met. I like to start podcasts that way. And I, I got to be honest with you. I've been thinking about it all morning and I can't really pinpoint. I think it might have been either at a KCBS awards banquet or it might have been exactly a- the first time I met you. Oh yeah, it was the '80s party at the KCBS banquet. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and you, y'all came all dressed up, and I'm like, "This dude's cool." Now I had knew you, and you had knew me through social media. You yeah, because I mean, obviously, I'm in Oklahoma, and you're clear out on the East Coast. So I anyway, forgot I about that party. Coast, but- yeah, but that's where I first met you. Like, Those dudes are cool. <laughs> well, it was funny because it was our first banquet and it said 80s party. And so we went through all these ruminations of we dressed up like Run DMC and we walk in there and nobody else is dressed up. And I looked at I looked at Kim and I said, well, we got two options. Like we can either go back to the room and change into normal clothes or we can just go in and own it. And she said... <laughs> Let's go. And, <laughs> and I remember was distinctly, I, I walked up to you, introduced myself. I said, it's a cool gig. And I think you just kind of said, I think we kind of misunderstood what this was. <laughs> like, you know, you were like the human mullet, you know, I'm sophisticated, but I like to party. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I, I remember now I remember it distinctly because I remember meeting you and being like, we had, had interacted on Facebook, but meeting like somebody that was that big into barbecue. And that was, I think that was the year that you were second in the points race. It being, I can't remember. Yeah. And uh, I was like, wow, this guy. And also one of the best team names in barbecue. And that's right. And I want to kind of ask you like, how did that team name come about? Well, it's, (laughs) it came about from the way it, looks dusty Rhodes and i were friends the wrestler uh-huh. uh, his wife and i and, and the boys and the girls are still you know close we're not super close but we talk a lot you know uh michelle dusty's wife and i still talk a lot and chris my wife talks we were friends started getting into barbecue we've been cooking this local contest for a couple of years and uh, we so we were going to cook this local contest 
And so I, I was talking to Dusty about it in barbecue. I said, I'm going to cook this contest, and I'm going to call myself the American Dream Barbecue Team. Well, he thought that was so cool. Then when fast forward a couple of years later to 2012, and I said, you know, we're going to kind of do this for real, and I'm going to get a logo made and all that. And he says, and, you know, put on, you know, on the side of my pit and stuff and T-shirts. He goes, well, make sure you put my picture on it. <laughs> you know, and true Dusty fashion, make sure you put my picture on it. <laughs> so I reached out to Patrick Carlson, the, the cartoon logos guy who's done a lot of uh, uh, team logos. Well, he just, he's from Georgia. So he happened to know Dusty Rhodes was a fan and everything. So he knew just exactly what to do, drew it all out, put this little pink pig in a headlock that Dusty had. And I showed that, I said, do you like this? Is this okay? He goes, yeah. He said, you just make sure that piggy's with me all the time. And so... <laughs> We went through two or three iterations. At first, when we were really on fire and having fun, you know, every year had a theme. The one year was uh, funky like a monkey, kind of like the old Dusty deal. And then the next year, we called it Plundering Through America. And in wrestling lingo, if you will, they got their own carny lingo. Plunder, when they talk about plunder, that's the stuff they sell out front. You know, their T-shirts, their pictures and all that. You know, if you got your plunder out there. And so plundering through America, we had, you know, Dusty with a knapsack over his back with money and trophies coming out of the back. And then the pink (laughs) piggy was rooting up trophies and money. So we were plundering through America. And so that was one of our themes. He just thought that was so wonderful. And then, uh, you know, after he passed in 2015, right at the height of our season that year, uh, we redid a logo for the next year. And, uh, had him kind of standing on a rock pointing up, you know, talking about his, uh, some of his reach for lightning bolt. And, uh, so, but we put pink piggy on the ground and had a tear coming down his cheek. <laughs> and I thought that'd be pretty cool. And honestly, I have not changed and done a new shirt since that. And I hate that it's six years, but it's just kind of hard to get off of that. But Absolutely. Anyway, there's the name. I'm sorry. It's, I'm you know it. what? No, no, it's fine. It's totally fine. Cause I've asked you that question before privately. And it's one of my favorite stories. I grew up a huge wrestling fan, both me and my brother. And when I was 21, my brother was still super into it. And I drove him all over the East coast up and down to different matches and different promotions. And he was super into it. So I was always a huge dusty Rhodes fan. And, um, I just love that story. You can see the smile that I have on my face when you tell it. It just brings me such such joy to hear that. And uh, it's one person, like, when they ask you if you could have dinner with, like, three people, he's usually on that list for me. <laughs> oh, my God. It's, you know, and, and what you see on screen and what you see off screen is about the same guy without so much of the hype, you know. But he's just so cool. He came to Plant City, Florida. Of course, he lived right down there to a contest we cooked way early on. And just sat out in front of everybody. It'd be, people would be walking up going, is Dusty Rhodes here? Dusty Rhodes here? And he'd look up and say, ah, he's in the back. Get the whiskey ready here. Uh, he's taking a nap right now. People wouldn't realize, you know, that it's actually him. It was, except for David Morrow. <laughs> Morrow knew it. Um, it's funny you say that. Uh, I'll tell you one more story about that. We were at the Royal one year. And a guy walks up and he says, uh, you know, that that's somebody else. That's 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 you're stealing a logo or something like that. And I said, no, nah, what do you mean? And uh, he said, well, I'm a personal friend of Dusty Rhodes's. You don't have authority to use his picture, this, that and the other. And I'm like, well, nah, it's OK. Uh, you know, I know him. And da, da, da. So I pick up the phone and call Dusty. I said, hey, there's some dude here saying he's your friend and that you're going to sue me for this logo. Dusty goes, put him on the phone. (laughs) (laughs) And and so I hit the speaker and this guy starts in. It does the end. I mean, the guy immediately realizes it's Dusty Rhodes. He's just going, oh, I was just joking with these guys. (laughs) So we get into that some and it was funny. And, And now there is a story that Vince McMahon somehow through their WWE channels saw our logo on Facebook and saw that kind of stuff and he calls calls him up and says, Hey, you realize or says, Hey, you realize there's somebody out here using your likeness and all this stuff. And he said, Yeah. He says, good friend of mine. And he says, Well, did you approve of that? He says, Yeah. He says, Well, 
what's he sells? You got a restaurant or what? He goes, no, no, you don't have anything. He just cooks that. He goes, well, tell him to go get some spices and, and, and put some salt and pepper and something with your picture on it. We'll sell it on the website. You know, it's all about that plunder, <laughs> if you will. Right. And, uh, yeah, but we never did that, you know, so, but it was cool though. Even Vince McMahon <laughs> noticed us. You know what? That's a great, uh, though about use about the word plunder the different vernacular that people use in terms of different activities and one of the things i think that we need to do in terms of barbecue and i think we might do it on this podcast is explain some of the terms that we use you know you know when we talk about gcs and rgcs and yeah. tables and stuff and and the layperson doesn't really understand what's going on. So I, that's been a little project that I've thinking about undertaking. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's true. You know, I mean, you know, a lot of people know what shigging means now, you know, and things like that, but yeah, there's every, it seems like everything has its own slang, if you will. Yep. Which if you will, is one of Dusty's. Dusty <laughs> you know, taking care of business in public, if you will. <laughs> but, uh, be pain, blues, and agony on them come Saturday at awards time. It's time to you're gonna have to deal with the dealer. <laughs> now that's it, that would be a great barbecue t-shirt. <laughs> oh, I used to do that shit with Travis back and forth. You know when we were doing the 2015 round. All right, Clark, it's time to deal with the dealer this weekend. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. We always had good fun. So you've been around for quite a while in the barbecue scene. What do you think was your biggest turning point? in your life as a pit master? Well, obviously when we won our first grant, uh, that first year in 2012, it was the last week to qualify for the Jack into July, Iola, Kansas. We were still turning in four meets with a mystery. You know, I, 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 at that time, I really never knew if my barbecue was good or if it was bad. It's just, I think I hit my marks. I think it looks like it's supposed to look because back then you just had static pictures on websites, not a lot of YouTube. You had classes and we took classes. Um, Scotty Johnson, cancer sucks was the first class I ever took. Still use a lot of that technique today. Um, not so much profiles cause those things change and we could talk about that, but you know, trim techniques, things to feel, you know, you have to use your fingers as well as your thermopins. And, and things like that. When, when we hit that GC, it's kind of like, okay, I must be doing something right. And I didn't even know I won till they called my name. We got our first 180 and, and that was in brisket. And then we were just so late. Oh man, we won brisket. We won a 180. Da, 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 da. Then they, you know, I'm not even worried about grants because we've set through eight or nine or 10 contests knowing that well, there's no way in hell we were going to be the grand champion. We've got a couple calls maybe. And then my friends now through barbecue, Scott and Rocky Key, he's turning around pointing at me. You've won, you've won. I'm like, no, no. David Bosco with Butcher Barbecue was there. He's turning around like, yeah, you've won. Hell, I wouldn't even pay attention how many calls I'd had. I've never learned to track calls during awards, you know, at that point. And then they called the American Dream Barbecue Team for Grand Champion. I'm like, Wow, we won. We we won one. And I and and to have been literally 50 years old, which I was, I turned 50 in April of that year. It was like I was like a new kid again. It's just like, you know, we'd won the 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 playoffs to, in the football season or something. It was just it was surreal. And I know that's an overused word and an under understood word, but it, it's just that moment that comes around you. I mean, it's like, you know, you see the stars around you, you feel that. Oh my God, you know, it's like, you know, you get your name called for to win the grand prize for something. And that's when I turned the deal. It's like, okay, now at least I'm on to something. I know how to win now. And that's the biggest problem today is people learn how to win. They forget how to lose. Mm -hmm. And my biggest reality check in that is Darren Worth. And, and once you start winning, he'll say, you've got to remember how to lose is more important than learning how to win. And I'm always reminded of that now too. Absolutely, because the law of averages really comes into it big time when we're talking about competition barbecue. 
Absolutely. And of course, you know, I was in the gaming business for 30 years and I played a lot of poker, you know, played a lot of poker professionally, played a lot of poker mentally. And if you don't take the, 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 the math into consideration, you know, you're going to be in for a big ass letdown because not all of life is fantasy. I hate to tell a lot of people that just because <laughs> you take the class, you watch the video, you buy the thermopin, you buy the sauce, you wear the t-shirt doesn't mean you're going to cook it right. And even when you do, it doesn't mean you're going to win. I learned that just like everybody else did. I think my advantage is, is I've remembered mm-hmm. every week. I remember if you don't do good, just those score sheet on the dash go on the house, you know, because the sun will shine on you for a period of time. And then the clouds will loom over you for a period of time. You just keep pushing. You know, this is, it's like the team of the year race. It's a marathon. It ain't a sprint. So cooking pro barbecue or contest barbecue, whether you're chasing points or not, it's always going to be a marathon. I mean, hell, I ain't won a contest since February of 2020. And from then it had been August of 2018 and you're calling me a legend. See what I mean? That's why I'm like, shit, I'm not out there tearing it up. But then again, everybody has their moment, you know, it, you know, it's, it's Brad and Joe's moment right now this year, last year. And there's some guys underneath them that are really chasing that are doing good. I am so proud of Travis Duffy. You know, oh, me too. A, a guy who has pounded it for years has been a Facebook warrior, has been a critic, has been a supporter, but has learned on his own. He's put it, pulled up his own boots with his own bootstraps. And he, 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 he hit that reserve grant Royal last year. And his whole persona changed on Facebook. I'm going to talk a little personal conversations between me and him. And I told him, I said, you know, at first I'd caught, reached out and congratulated him and stuff after he hit that. And uh, then later on, you know, I said, Man, you're, a little, uh, you're a little more docile on Facebook. He says, well, you know, I got to thinking, you know, now that I actually hit something that's royal, I'm kind of looked up to by a lot of people. And I've got to represent that. I can't just be an asshole on everything, <laughs> and, which I am. I mean, you know, that's just two asses talking to each other. So he's embraced it. And then for him to just step up out of the ashes again and nail it this year, uh, that is the American dream right there. Now that's the American dream. Uh, No big sponsors, just grounded out, grounded and pounded every week at home, perfect his craft. And then on the biggest stage, he was recognized for it. Absolutely. It was, uh, we were at the Royal a couple of weeks ago when they called him for GC. I, I was walking with a team from the East Coast that that didn't know him, and they were kind of like, you know, oh, I thought this contest was always won by, you know, the big teams. And I said, you're forgetting that he RGC'd this in 2019. So he has got this contest at least a little bit figured out. And and you're right. You know, he does he does work hard, and he's one of the people that I'm looking forward to having on here and getting the, getting his story out there. Yes. And he'd be a great interview, great speaker, you know, very articulate, he's very smart. He's very involved. He lives, eat and breathes barbecue, I believe. Yep. And get, going up and giving him a hug after he had won, that was, that was the big highlight of the Royal for me this year was, uh, you know, he's just sitting there, you know, face is all red from crying. And it's like, <laughs> it, it, that's the cool part of it. I mean, when he threw that trophy up over his head and they shot that confetti, that was nothing but pure emotion. There was no staging, no scripting. You know, that was pure emotion. I, yep. I just, it's always great to see too. And that's, that's what keeps us all coming back, you know, to do this over and over again is moments like that. It's really great to see. So one of the things that I, uh, I'm always wanted to ask you because you always do cute little Facebook posts and you've got some figurines and stuff. Are you a superstitious guy? Partially. It's more that than anything, you know, yeah, we've got the little dusty figure have always had it. Just that's, that's our little mascot. Chris does that. My superstition is circus peanuts, circus peanuts those little orange marshmallow depression area candy thing, the candy things. Yeah. I, I swear in the center of the earth, it's not this molten lava 
uh, which, you know, causes rotation. It's a big old circus peanut down there. You know, I used to tease everybody that I put a circus peanut in my brisket wrap until some people started taking me literally in like going, how do you get that orange tint off of your brisket from the circus peanut? I'm like, dude, I don't do that. It's just a joke. <laughs> and then you realize that power that you've got of influence of people once again. But now, I, you know, to me, I got to have my lucky circus peanut because I don't drink a lot. And so, but, you know, that's my lucky thing. And it's a gimmick. You know, it's yeah. Just, do you have any other rituals or routines that you have to do at a contest? Not really. Just prep. I've got a list of alarms on my phone, you know, 10 alarms deep to keep my mind, keep me from getting distracted. I always try and be in bed on Friday night by the time Blue Bloods comes on, which is 9 p.m. on CBS. That's kind of like, OK, everything's done. Get in bed and try and get to sleep because you're going to wake up at four o'clock even though your alarm's set at five i'm one of those people that can't get up early i mean when you call me about this podcast i'm like it means i got to get up an hour earlier but that's <laughs> I'm <gonna> do it. <laughs> so those are really my rituals i don't you know i don't i don't have a lot of other window dressings that's cool are you a music guy when you cook i used to be i used to have a playlist on my ipod of between bluegrass country and southern rock and now anymore it's just i don't you know if somebody else has always got some music playing so it's just a decent distraction and right. uh, i don't really play and usually simply because most of barbecue now is through football season i have a tv in our kitchen i have a toy hauler motor home that we converted the garage into a kitchen and so there's a tv back there and so i've always got the tv on there's ball game or something Saturday morning, you know, you go through the Saturday morning cartoons or used to be cartoons that play, but like the Mo You Knows on there and the one that deal about <laughs> the guy rescuing pets. I always know those are on. And it's like, okay, football should be playing when we're getting ready to prep chicken. And, you know, as far as getting chicken ready for the box, it should be football pregame on. And nothing worse early in the season, it's a damn infomercial because there's no football season. <laughs> but, uh, so you know what i mean so it's a little bit of a distraction because chris will look up and go there should be something besides an infomercial on right now you know, so <laughs> that, i guess so those are our disciplines if you will i can't remember if you i believe that you're a sooner fan correct yes yeah we don't need to talk about that shit well, from last much of a team right now anyway <laughs> well <laughs> They squeaked one out against my Mountaineers last week. <laughs> well, West Virginia gave them all they could handle. And I think I was at a Fiesta Bowl one year when West Virginia just wiped their tail in Phoenix. Yeah, yeah. That was the only time we've ever beat Oklahoma. We sure as hell haven't done it in the Big 12. <laughs> so when you're planning for a competition, is your week, your prep the week before, is it the same every week? Yeah, I try to. I usually, if we're cooking, I like to put my meat out for the thaw, my briskets and butts out the thaw. When I get back from a contest on Saturday night, or if we're home, I'll go out Saturday night or Sunday morning and take them out of the freezer and put them in the refrigerator. And uh, then I don't like to trim till Tuesday. I don't like to make my injections till at least Tuesday at the earliest because I believe the phosphates neutralize. And so if you make them really early, and I know guys that'll make their injections on Sunday. I know guys that'll trim on Sunday, but I back and seal everything. And I feel like I pull too much purge if I trim on Sunday and Monday and, and, and back and seal. Mm -hmm. I like to uh, thaw my ribs on, uh, put them out, you know, on Tuesday. And then so Wednesday night, I can get them trimmed up and not back and seal them real hard, but just seal them. So they don't purge. And then a lot of times we have to leave on Thursday to go to a contest because we like to get there Thursday night for some reason. It's just, I don't like rolling in at noon on Friday. A couple follow-up questions to that because I think there's some learning there. When you say purge, what do you mean? When you're pulling the liquid out of like your brisket and, you know, a lot of people think that's blood, but that, that red is not blood. It's just mild glycosis from the meat. But that's all liquid. That's, that's all moisture that you're taking out of the meat and that back and seal will kind of pull it out as it's thawing, especially after you've cut it and trimmed it, you've opened up wounds in the, in the cut that were already sealed from the freezing in the, in the packing process. Now I learned this from Travis and so I'm not going to take credit for it, but if you get a pork butt 
that purges a lot on you, it's just mild glycosin. It's just red water. Shoot it right back into it before you start injecting. It's its own natural juice again. And, you know, I'm saying after you get it inspected, you open it up, suck that red stuff in your syringe and go ahead and fill it back up. It's not spoiled. It's just left the product. Put it back in and then put your injection on top of it. And those phosphates will bind all that stuff again because that's natural flavor. Even though it's red and it's ugly and you think it's blood, trust me, folks, blood is black once it hits oxygen. It's not that real nice red stuff that we see. And uh, briskets, thank God, you know, that, that the quality of briskets we use now, which is a big source of contention for a lot of people, is that Wagyu's just don't purge like a prime or a choice brisket does. We all know mm-hmm. that. And, and just as part of the thawing process, they're going to purge. But then you don't want to over purge them at the same time. You know, by right. them and back and seal them. And I've got a chamber vacuum sealer. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it'll suck her down tight. And uh, I don't do that after I trim. Right, right. Wow. That That's tight. anybody listening to this podcast just got a very huge nugget of information from that. It's, uh, I'm not going to lie to you. That's something that I've thought about, but I didn't know the science behind it. And, I can tell you that I trimmed my briskets for the Royal probably about five days too early. And, uh, because I had a different consistency, I had a different consistency when I took it out of the, out of the back seal and I took it out and I went, well, okay, that's a problem. That's the thing that I try and impress upon anybody is that you always have to be learning in this game. Nobody knows everything. It's evolving. Every time a new rub comes out, the business has evolved one way or the other. Because if somebody uses that rub, they put a different influence in the tent. Wow. I was so intent on that. I had another follow-up question that I forgot. Uh, <laughs> uh, hopefully, I'll remember it. Um, but, yeah, that's, that is, that's a huge deal. You've got to preserve that meat. And I do not believe in trimming on site. A lot of guys do it because of their time factor or whatever. A lot of guys do it very successfully. I want to know exactly what I'm bringing. Right. If I'm going to, if I'm not going to open my ribs, I, I like to cook four racks of ribs. If I'm not going to open them up until I get on site, then uh, I bring an extra two racks of ribs because I can't guarantee there's not a shiner behind that big ass label. You right. Know, and I'm cooking pretty fresh primes this year and I've cooked a little bit of everything. And, uh, you know, I've cooked Smithfields, I've cooked Tyson's, I've cooked Comparts, you know, I've cooked the IBPs from Sam's, I'm cooking Prairie Fresh Primes this year, and I'm not endorsed by them or anything like that. But uh, they come two packs, and thankfully they come two packs packed bone to bone, so you can see the face on both ribs. But if I can't trim them before I get there, I take six racks with me. And then I just refreeze them to eat at the house. Uh, the ones I don't use, unless there's something really bad on one, I find a bad. I just toss it in the trash, and I hate to say that, but I do this year. You still right. don't waste anything. I still don't waste brisket trim. That's one reason why I don't trim a brisket on site, is because I save those trimmings and yield 150 pounds of ground beef after a 15 contest season. That's right. a lot of money. It's and money it's delicious. Yes, <laughs> we do all kinds of stuff from Taco Tuesday to casseroles to, you know, Wagyu uh, stew, you know, and, and uh, everything. Oh, uh, a brisket, a ground brisket uh, Wagyu lasagna. Oh, yes. Absolutely. You can't beat it. <laughs> well, I know at the KCBS banquet this year, just because of that, one of the uh, meals, that, one of the entrees for the buffet will be a uh, pasta with Wagyu, Snake River Farms Wagyu meatballs. Oh, wow. You know, I know they're gonna, the ground beef is going to come from Snake River, and they're going to make the meatballs with Wagyu meatballs. Very cool. Well, I'll give you a little hint there. There's a little insider deal. The banquet this year is going to be somewhat buffet style. You're going to get, you know, a couple of entree tickets, a dessert ticket, and then your normal stuff will be on the plate. National Turkey Federation is going to supply turkey, so there'll be a turkey station. Smithfield is going to supply pork, so there'll be a pork station. Uh, Snake River Farms is supplying 
uh, ground beef. So there'll be a pasta station with those meatballs. So you'll have a little bit of everything to uh, pick from and be able to get to. So if you want uh, marinated pork loin and, and pasta or turkey and marinated pork loin, you can do all that at the banquet rather than everybody gets to eat a piece of cold tender loin and a <laughs> potato for noon. But right. Food, banquet food. Hopefully banquet food. Good banquet food. Last thing you want to serve to barbecue cooks is banquet food. Oh, believe me, cooking those hot dogs for Snake River Farms at the Royal. Oh, those you know. are excellent. <laughs> it's it's such a hard job cooking hot dogs for 600 people. And everybody's got, got their own preference. They're like, I want mine barely cooked. I want mine scorched like it was yeah, a damned. Mean, give me them black ones, man. <laughs> but the texture of those Wagyu hot dogs is just day and night from everything else. I'm sorry, I'm digressing. Anybody but but it ruins... It ruins hot dogs for you for the rest of your life when you have one that's not a Snake exactly. River hot dog. You're just like, I, I, I don't want to eat this. <laughs> right. exactly. Well, one of the things that happens on these podcasts is we all like to talk about our our successes and how, how good we've done and stuff like that. I like to talk about failures. Do you have a favorite failure of yours where it really it taught you something that helped you be successful later? Sure. 2015 team of the year run. Travis and I were nip and tuck. And the only reason why we got into the team of the year chase anyway is early in the season, we won like four contests in a row. Well, that shoots you right to the top. And uh, then obviously, well, hey, we may be on our roll here. So we keep going and it's the tortoise and the hare. You know, here comes Travis, you know, and then Travis is ahead and I kept chasing. And, you know, every week was a dismal failure. Every week I was cooking outside of my region. And I do believe that very, that, that people don't understand that not only are there regional judging differences, there are regional profiles. There's a reason you win it, your contest in your hometown three out of five years because you're into a regional profile. Uh, but anyway, we were chasing all over the world. I think Travis was five points ahead of us. And if we would have won, we would have got ahead of him. And we went all over the Southeast, you know, at the end. It, it was just, it wasn't even fun. And it was all for naught because, you know, Ricky Bobby, if you're not first, you're last. <laughs> and uh, I stepped back after the season was over. And I told Chris, I said, let's just quit. I, I ain't no use chasing it. If, if it happens, it happens, but let's not go everywhere. And she goes, no, because you'll be sitting at home in January saying shoulda, coulda, woulda. And I just told a guy in a private message that same thing yesterday on Facebook who was who was uh, a new team that was just wanting to stay in the top 10 of his chase, third chase. Should I? Do you think I can stay in the top 10 or you think I should keep pushing? And I basically said, you know, you got to decide what you want to do if you can drop this one contest of your five that wasn't a top 10 then you know you're a lock and i said otherwise you're going to set it home in january say it shoulda coulda woulda if i just went ahead and went to that contest and so yeah that was my biggest uh, disappointment that i learned is that quit chasing it just let it happen if it happens it happens if it don't it don't at my but it's but it's hard. 30 and 40, like a lot of you guys. Yeah, I'd be out there full of piss and vinegar, you know, like Brad and Joe. And they have a reason to be team of the year. They have a commercial reason that 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 helps their personal businesses and stuff. Me, that wasn't me. I was just out having fun. And I took the competitive where it almost didn't be fun anymore for a while. It's, yeah, the one year that we went real hard chasing chicken points. And we had cooked 14 weekends in a row. I remember that 14th weekend very distinctly. It was in Salisbury, North Carolina. And I looked at Kim afterwards and I said, we need some time. Like, this has become, number one, the driving has become too much. Number two, I feel like we're just going through the motions at this point. And just, you know, it drains you. Exactly. That's exactly what it was. We were just performing a routine. You know, we were orthodontists at that time. I just get up in the morning and pull wisdom teeth all day. 
you know, I don't change the smile. I just pull the wisdom teeth after doing it so long. And, and that's what it became. And, it, and if any of you guys are listening to this, you know, don't let it be a deterrent from your will, whatever your gut's telling you you want to do. Just understand when it's over. It may be over before you think it's over. And if it's over before you want it to be over and you recognize it's over, don't be a fool. You know, W.C. Fields said this best. He paraphrased, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again, then quit. There's no sense of making a fool out of yourself. <laughs> and I use that a lot. I think about that a lot. That's a, that's a great quote. I don't think I've heard that one before. Um, <laughs> of course, How is, three stooges said it first, if you don't succeed, keep sucking till you get it right. And, you know, <laughs> that's me and ribs. I've yet to have a 180 in ribs my whole damn career, a 256 really? contest. I've never had a 180 in ribs. Wow. Huh. Yeah. Tell me about it. I have 206 contests. I've never had a 180 in pork. It's the one that avoids me. <laughs> and every year when we set our goals, that's one of the things that I say, you know what, this is the year. I'm going to 180 pork this year, and uh, it just never happens. <laughs> it changes. Absolutely. Every year it changes. And I think that's what a lot of new teams, when they come in and they're successful right out of the gate, I don't think that they grasp the ebbs and flows of trends and different things that people are doing. And, and I think, I think having you and I've both been around for 10 plus years doing this. So we know that things change and we've seen it. And I think a lot of teams that come in, they hit it hard. They're doing great. And then shit changes on a dime and then they don't know the, middle of the season. Right. Or across the state line. Well, and you can artificially set the curve now thanks to social media. Yeah. Who ever heard of bacon until right. a year? <laughs> how many actually know how to cook bacon smart? You know, we all started cooking bacon, and, and here's, here's one of those tidbits. Never dawned on me until I was watching a barbecue league video when Brad just, I don't know that he was giving up the secret subliminally or just talking to you know keep the content flowing but when he's harvesting that bacon he said if the fat comes off real easy the bacon's overcooked you've got to kind of fight to get that sinew off the back of that bacon and i've been cooking it where i could just take my fingers and just shred the fat off of it the light went on ding all right, now I know when the bacon's cooked enough. And you got to remember, I'm cooking a jambo versus a drum, so I got to put all those different changes in. Those are things. You listen not only to what they're showing you. Listen with your ears. Watch with your eyes, but listen with your ears because we can't control the left side of our brain when the right side's trying to be creative. So, you know, creative. So, you know, if the, if the intelligent side, you know, lets out that little secret that, Hey, you know, it's cooked right. If you have to fight to get sinew off of it versus if it just starts flaking off, oh shit, I know it's overcooked. You gotta think. You gotta yeah. Think. You and I had that same epiphany watching that thing. I, uh, exactly. see what I mean? What Cause I was, I was nuking it, you know, getting it to the point yeah, where, oh, this bacon. pulls off great. And then you've mushed the bacon at that point. Yeah, exactly. And then I'm like, how am I screwing this up, man? It tastes wonderful. You know, and that's me and ribs. You know, is it too tight or are they too loose? Yeah. Yep. And I, I, we cooked that Jacksonville contest earlier this year, and it's one of the few times a year that Kim and I cooked out of a pop up. So we're out there in the middle of everybody, and I'm pulling that spoon across the bacon, mm -hmm. and I'm fighting it, you know. And uh, Darren, Darren's walking back from turning the box. He goes, that one's perfect. <laughs> See? See, there's yep. the things that the seasoned guys, I'm not saying we're better than anybody else, but those are the things we've learned to listen for. I don't care what it looks like. I'm not watching him stroke the damn fat with a spoon. I'm listening to what he's saying. You right. Know, what, what's he discovering when he's opening that up? You know, I mean, uh, it, <laughs> this sounds crazy. It's just like an autopsy. That's why they record an autopsy. They don't video them, but they record them because the guys, you know, he's announcing what he's actually d detecting while he's opening the body. Well, that's what we're doing is performing an autopsy on a pork butt. 
That's hundred percent right. <laughs> that might be the title of this episode. Episode oh, autopsy. Geez. Performing <laughs> barbecue autopsy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about gear. You are. Uh, what's one of the? We'll get into pits here in a minute, but I think I know the answer to this question. What's one of the best or most worthwhile investments that you've ever made in competition barbecue? You're going to think I'm crazy. 24 inch foil. 24 inch foil. <laughs> it, you pay a little more for it. You got to get it usually from a restaurant supply place, but it's big enough. You don't have to worry about the seams leaking. You can wrap a big brisket flat in it with one piece. You don't have to worry about the sides being too short and the wrap coming out. It's always a thicker grade than just your typical 18 inch big box door foil. Uh, it just makes it easier. You know, I go out there and I rip, and that's one of those rituals too. I'm sorry. I always pull my foil on Friday night or Thursday night when I get there or Friday morning early. I never pull my foil on Saturday morning, mainly because it used to be the old moniker. Everybody says, God, there's nothing worse than waking up and hearing somebody ripping foil. And, <laughs> you know. and so I've always pulled my foil the night before for some weird reason. I have them right up on a shelf over my table, just like I got my pan liners all in on Friday morning, you know, and, and my extra pan liners from when after I finished injecting, you know, to be able to replace them, not chasing. It's all about being that. But yes, I'd say 24 inch foil is one of them. After 10 years, there's probably five or six of them that are really important to me. Such as? A good Cuisinart grease separator. Fat separator. Oh, not super the important. Not kettle looking one. So when you pull the button and it just drops it right out of the bottom. Yep. You know, that's important to get good au jus. And I use au jus on everything. You know, yeah. I mean, even I, I separate the fat on my chicken pan and use a little bit of that chicken juice to thin my sauce with. Because why thin sauce with apple juice when you can thin it with its own flavor? Absolutely. And keep the grease out of it. Uh, yeah. That's one. Uh, a good set of tweezers are good. Uh, one thing I found just simply because I was exposed to it, it's 10 times better than a Q-tip or these sponge wipes that are a sponge. Mm -hmm. We use them to clean print heads on printers with. You know, I've got some oversized printers, print big posters. And so you can get them like a hundred of them for $5. They absorb all that crap around the box really easy. Hmm. Still can't bring myself to spraying Pam on my tail yet, but uh, at least I can clean my box up good. You know, we saw that trick done this weekend. Uh, Kim had heard about it and the team we were next to, they were getting ready to do it. And she asked, can I come over and look at that and watch that? And, uh, she came back and she went, man, I don't know. <laughs> Here's the hell out of me. It's just like not washing your pit. You're introducing something foreign right at the last minute to your meat. They say it doesn't affect it, but then again, their shit may taste so bad that it helps. It. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I, she told me about it and I was like, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> it, looks, it's, it really is. It does look good. It darkens that kale up. It really makes it pop. But I, I don't know. I just can't bring myself to do it. You know, I can shoot. I can shoot the uh, my glove went right back into a purged pork butt. But I can't spray Pam on my kale. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, you already answered. I think a hundred times what purchase of a hundred dollars or less has positively <laughs> impacted your barbecue life. What are some of the best decisions that you made when you first started cooking? a class took a class i was uh obviously now i come back from the day that you use stubs pork marinade in your pork wrap i'm from the day that bovine bold and yard bird and guns hot and cimarron docks were the only things to think about using you know i come from the day that you had to go 50 50 blues hog and blues hog tennessee red you know if it didn't pucker, it didn't score, you know, those kind of days. And uh, head country with a little honey, you know, those kind of deals. Uh, I could, but so a lot of things have evolved since then. And uh, so you always have to continue. Uh, I mean, Absolutely. I an answer, but that's what impacted me the most was taking a class 
learning that technique. And I, I took a class every year until I pretty much took all the classes I could take, you know, now, and I, I don't mean any disrespect. If you don't have as many contests as I do, you don't have as many grand championships as I do, just cause you got a logo hanging on the top of your hat. Doesn't mean I'm gonna give you a thousand dollars to teach me anything. You know, I don't think you should be out there putting on classes unless you walk that aisle, as Ric Flair would say. And uh, <laughs> that's why, you know, I, I, I have a problem with a lot of people doing classes. I really have a problem with these guys selling these video classes that I'm an eight-time world champion. Okay, well, what really is a world champion? You know, and, uh, you know, I'm going to get a little asshole political about that. But the bottom line is, is you're just doing it to call in a mark and uh you know a mark is a wrestling fan just to call in somebody like that and get their money and thank you teaching them stuff and they may get a couple of nuggets but i'll guarantee you it's something you learn from someone else's class and i was asked that same question dave why don't you do a class well all i'd be doing is saying what i learned from scotty johnson donnie teal rod gray uh, fred robles here lately you know because I've learned little nuggets from them that all incorporates into my stuff. I would be teaching things that Sterling Ball shared with me in confidence. You know, hey, here's some things to work with. I would be uh, sharing things that Darren Worth had shared with me in confidence. Scott Key. So it, but then I'm going to monetize those things. To me, that's hypocritical. And you guys that are fit in the mold I'm talking about, if you get mad at me, kill it. <laughs> <laughs> You just mentioned a bunch of names. Legends, uh, true legends in my true. life. I'm mentors. <laughs> who has impacted your life? Through. Yeah, who has impacted your life the most in competition barbecue? Jesus, they're all tied. Yeah. I knew you were going to ask me this question because I watch your podcast. They're all tied. I mean, Johnny Trigg at 83 years old, just turned 83 a few days ago, out there nailing it yet still very, very humble. Johnny's cockiness is just part of his persona. You know, Johnny Trigg is just as cool as he can be. Darren Worth, met him, didn't even know who the hell he was in St. Louis, Missouri at a Sam's local contest way back there. I didn't know who he was. He just nice guy and we visited and stuff. And then it was only after we got home and got to look, oh, that's Iowa Smokey D's. Wow, that's that Darren Worth guy. You know, just as cool as I look up to him, you know, uh, I, 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 Scotty, Scotty likes to stir it up and be a butt on Facebook and stuff. That's just Scotty. But I learned a lot from Scotty at first and, and he picked up the phone, even though the class, it was two months, uh, uh past, he still pick up phone and answer a question on something I missed, you know, uh, Rod Gray. To this day, I didn't see Rod for almost a year, and he was at the uh, Darren's Pork Fry. And, <laughs> and and it was really cool to see Rod. I mean, you know, hey, Dave, how are you doing? Good to see you. I still use things he taught. Took Dan Hickson in uh, uh, Left Coast Q's class. You know, I still use some things from there. Every time I cut the back of the top flat off the of pork butt, I think about Dan Hickson because that's one of the things he taught in his class. You know, how to bring that back before you. This was back before we deboned everything. And uh, so all of those guys are mentors. All those guys are mentors. But then there's some guys that have made a total ass of themselves, themselves through their success and then pending failures that have been examples for me as well as how to not act in this business. And I'm mm -hmm. the worst at flying off the handle, but I, I try <laughs> to be very reserved. And I think about that. Well, gee, I don't want to look like that guy. I'd rather look like this guy. So yeah, those are my heroes. There's a there's a Mount Rushmore barbecue heroes to me. Absolutely. When you hear the word successful in terms of barbecue, who's the first person that pops into your mind? I would think the most successful at, in 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 the whole picture is Darren. He's won everything there is to win, but he's gracious. He still has time for everyone. Uh, that's tied among three people, Darren, Tuffy, Chris Lilly, all of those guys, and Johnny are all very, very humble. Byron acts like he's big 
cock of the walk and all that stuff. But you walk by Byron's trailer at the Royal and stop and shake hands. And he said, how are you doing, sir? Good to meet you and all that. They all have time for you. That to me is success in barbecue more than a big check and a big trophy. Absolutely. It's the, it's the whole chillada, if you will. Yep. There was a video uh, from this year's Royal of Tuffy riding a kid's skateboard around the parking lot. Just, just watching Tuffy ride a skateboard and doing it well. I mean, he was doing turns and stuff, and I was like, I was like, you know, that's that's what makes what we do so great is that the people that everybody thinks are are you know super celebrities and they're they're the nicest people in the world. They don't exactly. Kelly Wirtz is another example of that. Oh yeah, both as people I look up to, and I'll, you know, Kelly's just. Kelly is Kelly every day of the week. And if Kelly may not offer you a tip, but he'll dang sure give you the answer if you ask the right question. Right. Mike Hayes used to be that way. He's passed now. He used to be with KCBS. Uh, he was one of the guys that we kind of looked up to. And, uh, you know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't just lay something on you. But if you ask him the right question, he would give you the right answer. Uh, so that, that's, that's some of that stuff that's really good. Uh, yeah, that's you're a, dude. I'm not putting you over here because we're on your show, but you're a success story of what <laughs> it's about. You've had some success. You and your wife do it as a husband and wife activity. It's obvious you have fun, or y'all wouldn't go out there and dance on the stage and stuff like that. You know, that's not a put on. You know, that's not a scripted deal. Oh, we won a chicken. Let's do a dance. No, you're actually enjoying life and what barbecue is doing with it what this competitive sport of ours were i wish we could change the name from kcbs to kcts just to kansas city tailgate society that's <laughs> what i wished it would be again just a big old ass potluck tailgate thing and take the politics and the competitive side away and we just all show up in this town this weekend and have a good old time and then go to the house Man, you just gave me chills because I haven't publicly talked about the chicken win. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, we were walking up there and, you know, we're both, everybody's out of control. And I just listened to the music and they were playing one of Kim's favorite Beastie Boy songs. <laughs> and I looked at Kim and I was like, I don't know how this happened <laughs> that they're playing this song, but this is unbelievable. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So loaded question coming. Um, and I'm going to ask this before we get into our rapid fire questions, because those are my favorites. Let it fly, baby. I can handle it. <laughs> what What is your compelling future slash vision for competition barbecue? Where do you think we need to go? Competition barbecue, the model. And I'm going to speak to KCBS's model because there are some other models out there that are poised, that are growing with the industry. But KCBS model can't keep up with the growth that it has produced. Uh, I look at the, the loss of the Sam's Club tournaments as about as like the assassination of John F. Kennedy. We were all on a high as a nation. And then a lone gunman supposedly just took out the president, took out the heart of our country. And we have this void. Every week we waited on the results to come in. This was pre live stream on Facebook. Is the Sam's results? Who won? Who's going to post who won? Who didn't win? Who's going? Who, who made the regionals? I'm already in the regionals. Now, who am I going to be cooking against? We had 20 weeks of positive distraction. We don't have that anymore. And when the void fell out uh, from some fault of its own and some no fault of its own, because KCBS is comprised of a bunch of laymen who can win a popularity contest, the, the leadership of KCBS. Heretofore, in the last couple of years, we've tried to steer it where there are professions you know, there are certain disciplines that get on the board that lend a marketing hand, an accounting hand, a business management hand. You know, in addition to just I'm a judge, I'm a rep, I'm a cook because it's a big business. But because we have so many teams competing, 
We have so many contests. We have so many members that feel like that because you're a member of a nonprofit, you don't have that same mentality as an ownership member in say Walmart. I own a thousand shares of Walmart. I should be able to tell them to move the garden hoses over to the automotive aisle because I own stock in this company. Walmart will tell you, go fly a kite. Well, problem is, is that same guy that has that $40 membership with KCBS believes he has the right to tell you to change this. And collectively, the membership does have that right, but individually they don't, but the loudest voice on Facebook, you know, gets where it is. We've got to adjust our model some way. The single meat categories is one of them. Uh, the new stake program that has that is rolling out is another. And then when I say adjust of a model, it's an alternative. You know, we did a lot of work and I could do a whole podcast on the stake thing. So, but we did a lot of work in developing this stake program that even things changed once the pandemic hit because we saw all the numbers changing of all these new customers, you know, as far as sauce and rub companies, but people learning how to cook because the restaurant was closed. Take that passion of learning how to cook to a competitive level or to an outdoor activity, to a social activity. Let's provide an alternative. You know, we were the original, so let's let's wake up and, and be the original again. But KCBS, the four meat categories are tough. We made some changes to the pork rule this year because pork was unenforceable. We all knew that. Uh, I never had my pork weighed in all the years that said I had to weigh four pounds. So it creates a disadvantage. It's like some of that, like I said, uh, uh, setting that curve to showing boxes on Facebook. Same way here. Upon inspection, you know, must be cooked whole. Well, how do you cook a pork butt whole if you can cut her down to four pounds? Define whole, define upon inspection. So all the guys that are trying to follow the letter of the rule wonder, well, why is my pork not getting done? Well, why can't I do this one? Because it's being gamed. The system's gamed through interpretation. Well, let's take the ambiguity of the pork rule out. And I am told, and I've seen it on social media from the actual person that was involved in it, the only reason why the pork rule evolved is pork used to be wide open. And a prominent person cooked the whole hog and got beat by a pork tenderloin in the contest. Well, that's not a level playing field. Well, the best tasting pork won the contest. It just happened to be a pork loin and not a whole damn hog. So mm -hmm. where is it? What is it? It's 2021. We have to evolve. The biggest anchor, you know, chain carrying around in four categories was that crazy ass pork rule. So let's fix it. Let's just fix it. Let's make it just like the other four. Otherwise, I think you ought to have to have a whole chicken at inspection. Then that once inspected, it may be trimmed or whatever you want to trim it. You know, if you want to look at it one way, you got to look at it the other. Mm -hmm. We are a hotter and a faster and a quicker society. I've learned I manage Fire Lake Arena in Shawnee, Oklahoma. So I've got to figure out how to do concerts and do events that attract every demographic in the world. And I've found that our generations now of, of, of the people that have the new fresh expendable income, which are kids out of college, guys out of high school, people, younger people, the kids now, I'm 60, these would be kids that would be my kids coming out or grandkids. They want instant gratification. They don't want to take a lot of time. They want to show up and do their thing and go on to the next thing. That's why millennials in, in these guys, they don't buy houses. They don't like to buy cars. They don't buy jewelry. They don't want those long-term commitments. Well, that's trickling down, if you will, in a Reagan economy. <laughs> again. That's trickling down to barbecue. We want to come and have fun and light them fires at six o'clock and cook it and win. And the smart guys develop ways to do it. That's why they're on top. And, and you know, we were cooking hot and fast in Jambo. It's just we're, we're cooking fast enough or hot enough. We had too big a chambers. <laughs> and, you know, drums have changed the business, changed the world. You know, they've changed the world. I can't say for the good or the bad because, you know, it, there's nothing but good coming out of them. But they're a more affordable entry into this business. It's easier to cook on them. I love it when, when, when Brad and Tim say just cook needles up. 
you know, quit playing with the dials, just get her needles up and go. I love how they say, you know, I don't worry about what the temperature says. I put my hand over and feel the compression coming out of the stack. Well, everybody can feel the fan blowing on their, on, you know, the, the convection coming out of their hand. I'm sorry. I'm used my hands. No, no. Audio podcast. Yeah. But uh, those are techniques to just shorten that curve and learn how to enter. It's what makes the drum so much better, you know, in, in for those things. I like the flavor of drum, but I'm a jambo purist. I'm still stuck in my ways. I'm part bad. Change. <laughs> well, I want to change it for anything. Right, right. So, so uh, the, but then again, my jambo has a carrier for a drum built into it as well. <laughs> so those are things, you know, that's changed in barbecue. I'm sorry, I've got way off the deal, but the KCBS no. model has to correct itself to, to its clientele. And the KCBS is a big old ship with a little small prop. So it's very hard to turn and it's hard to make fast, sometimes despite itself and sometimes as a benefit to itself. You know, sometimes we knee jerk, uh, no forks in the judging tent versus certain. And then sometimes we make a decision that's a whole lot better analyzed than the six keyboard warriors out there that say, well, I trust the math, I trust the math. Well, but you're not getting the math unless, you know, that's seating. Right. Stuff. Right. Wow. Well, thank you for that. That's uh, and that's, there's a lot of good points when I think when you said our society is basically hot and fast, that's, that's a very good term. We want instant <laughs> gratification, you know, and things come quicker and they go away faster. And, I don't you know, I want to go to the moon, set it home and get it streamed too. Right. You know? I don't want to go to Walmart and wait in line. I'm going to call Amazon. They'll be here tomorrow. Yep. Yep. I'm a victim of that myself. I think we all are. I ordered five things yesterday. <laughs> well, and, and guys now in a lot of cities can get Amazon delivery same day, same day. That's Absolutely. Unbelievable. You know, and I'm out here in Tecumseh, Oklahoma, and we still get prime next day, which is great. And what freaks me out, which is, this is one thing of, of the realization of myself. My grandfather was a rural mail carrier. In a lot of places, you know, you went to the local grocery store over there and got your mail. They didn't deliver it to your house because it was five miles off the highway. This, that, and the other. Now Amazon and FedEx Home, they deliver to your house on Sunday. Absolutely. It's unheard of. <laughs> no wonder the post office has gone broke because they won't get out of the Monday through Friday routine. And, and, you know, they will come on Saturday, but you're lucky if you get it on Saturday, you know? Right. We, we're not, a, KCBS is the United States Post Office of the damn delivery business. <laughs> we're still, we're the oldest, we're probably still the best and most reliable, but where it takes us a while to make the change, you know? Change is a bad word in a lot of uh, organizations, especially member-driven and member-led organizations. Why change? Well, we've got to reach out to the membership. Well, we reached out to some of the membership. Well, you're not being transparent enough. Well, God, you know, I, you, you, you know, and I used to be the mayor of my town. I was on the school board. I've been on a rural water district, you know, chairman of the state gaming association for almost 30 years consecutively. I know what it means that you can make some people happy. You can't make some people can't make everybody happy at once but the people that still aren't happy i owe responsibility to explain my position to that's been the toughest you know especially now the keyboard days are there yeah you know, anybody can go on social media and and do your thing and yes i've done it i've been on i've been on both sides of that you know i wouldn't be on the kcbs board if i hadn't pointed out deficiencies a reason why i wanted to run and if you ask me, I think I did a hell of a job last three years. Yes, you know, some of the people, they say he was a letdown. You know, he didn't do what we wanted to do. Did I walk into a brick wall? Yeah, but I busted a hole right through that son of a bitch, too. Yep. Well, you've been more than yeah. gracious. We're getting all politics now. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. You've been more than gracious with your time, but now I want to hit you with the rapid fire questions. And uh, okay. and uh, I'm very. these are my favorites. So. What do you see about barbecue on social media that upsets or bothers you? <laughs> and like I say, I've watched this, uh, I've listened to this podcast a lot and I've anticipated this question. <laughs> what bothers me the most, and it goes back into what we kind of finished here, is guys with very marginal success in this industry 
in this competitive sport, throw their boxes out there on Facebook and talk about how the judge just screwed them with eights or I've got two sevens in taste. Look at this box. They walk the aisle enough times to decide that maybe your box wasn't that good. You know, starting to have t-shirt made up like that. Maybe your food's not as good as you, you think it is and that kind of stuff. <laughs> I always, I always on Monday look at my boxes from Saturday. And I'll give you a textbook example of this. I would have got a 180 at the Royal in Brisket, but I finished fifth with a 179.44, which means I was one eight in appearance off. Monday, I looked at that box again. The front slice was in backwards. Oh, <laughs> oh man. It's little things like that. And I we do the same thing. I, I go 155 contests in. Yeah. You know, I, I've got a 32% call ratio in brisket alone. In the front slice, I put in backwards. In a trained eye, can see it. And yep. the trained judge saw it and gave it an eight where everybody else gave them nines. I deserved it. Yep. I think that's the number one thing I think that needs to change in barbecue as a whole is being honest with yourself about your product and what you're turning in. And, you know, we're all well, used our, to. Our, our vanities on social media won't allow us to be honest with ourselves. We all have to be Hulk Hogan. We yep. all have to be Michael Jordan. And if not, it's someone else's fault. I learned that. I mean, I'm, I'm the, I hate judges at four o'clock on Saturday afternoon. And then I get home Saturday night and start looking at my stuff and going, you know, that's probably about right. Yeah. Or I look, you know, they didn't like the whole table. You know, if I'm not, if I get a low score and I'm first on the table, well, they still like mine better than everybody else. But if I hit a good table and I'm fifth on the table, it wasn't the judges. Yeah. You know, I had the table average report created and put on the website under your team deal. So you can see where all the table variances were. If you had a top three table out of a, out of a six table contest and you hit one of the top three tables and you came in fourth on the table, it wasn't the judges, pal. It just, let's go back to regional judging, and regional flavor profiles. You may hit your marks, but that flavor did not work for that three hour drive from home contest. You know? Yep. It falls all back to once again, Darren Worth, the least offensive barbecue wins. Yep. Do you have a favorite pre, during, or post competition meal? I like Mexican food before. A lot of people like it afterwards. I like to eat Mexican food on Friday for lunch for some reason. Uh, afterwards, if we can get home, just a good old thin, crispy Domino's pizza or a KFC famous bowl, you know, something, <laughs> call it. something that involves mashed potatoes, gravy, and corn, green beans. <laughs> Do you have a favorite present that you like to give to people? You know, I've thought about that. You know, some people said bourbon. Chris Lilly said bourbon, bourbon. Um, it, it, it matches what I, if I give somebody something that matches what I feel like that complements them for something they need, you know, like here's a timer. You know, that's another one of those under hundred dollar deals is thermal works timer. When you think it's done, set the timer for five minutes, cook it till it's tender after you cook it till it's done. You know? <laughs> so, you know, I'm always, you know, those kind of things. I'll give out timers or I'll, you know, go hand them you know, something. That's cool. Last question. My favorite question. If you could have a gigantic billboard anywhere with anything on it, getting a message out to millions, what would it say and why? I used to have some ink pens with this printed on them. It says, live every day as if it was your last because one morning you'll get lucky. <laughs> That's great advice. That's great advice. So if you want to well, be Dave smug all your life, be smug because you're going to die smug. <laughs> happy, be happy because then you'll die happy. <laughs> That's another good billboard. <laughs> Well, David, or thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, David, I want to thank you for being on here. This has been one of my favorite episodes. 
Uh, there's a lot of great information on here. Tell people where they can find you online, even though most people know how. You know, I don't have I have I don't have a website. Facebook American Dream Barbecue uh, has a Facebook page, and then of course you know I've got an email address with KCBS while I'm still on the board. And like I say, reach out and find me. You know, I'm not too good to talk to anybody. Great, man. Well, thank you for taking the time, and I look forward to seeing you here and in a few minutes. And I've got to put over your format. I like your format. You ask very directed questions, you know, that because it creates a census. You know, now it's not just, well, this is a hodgepodge today, and it's a hodgepodge for this guy tomorrow. You follow a format, and we really get to listen to guys. You know, like I say, that's why I listen to it, because I like to hear the point of views. Well, and part of it for me is is that it keeps me on track. But also the big part for me is preserving stories and preserving how people got involved, especially, you know, one of the things that I spent a lot of time at at the Royal this year was talking to people who were great before I even knew that this existed. Yes. And and, and talking with them and getting to meet them and, you know, some of our future guests, I'm going to have uh, Q out. I'm going to have squirrel, you know, guys that, that have stories and that do things a certain way that I think we all need to number one, remember. And number two, I think a lot of people can learn from. Yeah. Well, then you got people like Don and Sharon will smokers wild. They're retired down in Florida now, but they were cooking KCBS in Kansas city when 30 people were in KCBS. I mean, he's got a two digit member number. Yeah. You know, won the Royal but then won a ton of contests. Those are the people, those are the damn forefathers of barbecue. If you will. Absolutely. The dudes that just are out there to have a book from it. Right. Right. Well, thanks again for your time, my friend. And I look forward to seeing you. <laughs> All right. Have a good day. Yep. You too. Thank you for listening to Pitmaster, an old Virginia smoke podcast. Be sure to subscribe and like the podcast, rate the podcast and share it out with all your friends. Also be sure to check out the old Virginia smoke YouTube channel as well. We will have another episode for you next week for companies interested in advertising. Please contact old Virginia smoke directly via www.oldvirginiasmoke.com. Pitmaster and old Virginia smoke podcast is edited by Chris Sedenka. Pitmaster and old Virginia smoke podcast is a property of old Virginia smoke, LLC. All rights are Reserve, copyright 2021. Yes. Old Virginia Smoke. Old